I've been asked to give this talk, and it's actually a difficult subject. Uh, many of you are familiar with the aspect we call biophila, you know, the concept of making your backyard into kind of a sanctuary. And uh, for example, the National Wildlife Federation actually has a formal program. But for example, that program has been in effect for at least eight years, and there's only about 100,000 people that they have certified, or 100,000 yards. So it's a very difficult situation. And one thing I want to point out, you know, we do live in an urban landscape, and this is just as, uh, and the fact that uh, there are things that, you know, we can do, and there's things we just can't do when it comes to attracting insects. And most of you know that famous quotation, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. And I'm talking about insects, of course. And uh, the fact that they're you know, pollinators, decomposers, and part of the food chain, but they also are pests. And so there's always this conflict, and I hope I'll address that. And uh, another situation is, if you really want your yard to look like some of these pictures I'm gonna show you, it's a major effort. And, you know, I love, I tried very hard to make my yard a sanctuary. So again, what I'm going to do is kind of an overview of this concept, and I'm going to run through this rather quickly, because some of you are probably more interested in the birds. You know, they're cuter, and um, they're bigger. And that's another thing I wanted to point out. You know, most insects that you find in your yard are small, and most people dream of these butterflies, but as many of you realize, that's often a difficult thing to consistently, persistently attract these beautiful insects. As many of you know, this is a well-known area. You know, there's all kinds of publications available. Uh, there's even Dr. Oppler and Whitney Cranshaw has uh, provided a really nice uh, service and action sheet that some of you can easily access through the internet. And they very clearly pointed out some of these quick facts that there are many kinds of butterflies and other insects in Colorado. Uh, we estimate perhaps in Larimer County there's anywhere from five to 6,000 species of insects. And one thing I do also want to mention that unfortunately, just think about this, one out of every five insects that you see in your backyard in Fort Collins are not native, they're invasives. You know, from the honeybee to European paper wasp to the earwig, imported cabbage, a worm, you know, the white butterfly that you see. So that's another dilemma. You surely will have insects in your backyard, but they're maybe not the ones that you really would like to prefer. So here are some of the facts I'm gonna try to present. One, that garden plants can affect the occurrence of these types of insects that I mentioned. And again, you know, some of this also revolves around the fact that you have to know a little about insects, and that's where sometimes somebody knows what a butterfly is, you know what a wasp is, what a bee is, a fly, but perhaps, you know, which ones you really want is another story. And if some of you are ever interested, I wanted to point this out, we have three million insects in our museum at CSU, and you're welcome to come and browse through those three million insects <laughs> and uh, look over the 65,000 species we have represented and then you walk out and say, okay, uh, you know, what does that say? But uh, you're most welcome. So there are successes for attracting insects to your garden, and there are three major types of successes. So you need food for the immatures, and that's another situation, you know, that a lot of times uh, you have the adults, but you may not have the immatures uh, in your yard. And again, I'll just mention you can actually attract uh, certain insects by planting some of the food plants of these insects you're willing to attract or wanting to attract. And of course, you need food for adults, and then you need what we call shelter. And this revolves around uh, everything from surviving, you know, storms, winds, to overwintering. And that's another problem in these yards because all of you realize, you know, most people are interested in well manicured yards. You know, how many of you like, you know, all your flower beds perfect? You know, everything in your yard just uh, wonderful. And of course, those aren't the type of yards that you will attract insects. So here are the conflicts I wanted to point out. First of all, there are probably the more attractive plants that are very good for getting insects to visit or can uh, persistently visit your yard 
are often considered weeds in other settings. And you know, there are neighborhoods in Fort Collins here that have certain ordinances that you know, prevent some of these weeds from being even existing in those type areas. Uh, second, there are a few insects that are actually very nice, but they're considered pests in some of their other stages. Like some of you ever try to grow uh, cabbage products, you know, there's a nice imported cabbage worm that'll make nice holes in your leaves and you get all upset. But it's a very common insect here in Fort Collins. The second is that, then this is, we get a lot of requests or questions about this. Well, I want these insects, but I don't care to have these other insects. What insecticides can I use? <laughs> and so all of you realize that's not a compatible situation. You know, almost all pesticides that are available, even to the home gardener, gardener can have some uh, deleterious or negative impacts on your insects. So this is another thing. And then, of course, it also depends on how much damage, quote unquote, you're willing to uh, you know, accept in your yard when you look at your leaves and they're all chewed up. You're looking at a nice, nice frass that's at the bottom of the, you know, that's the insect poop, how much you like that in your yard. So there's a lot of things you, know, you have to think about before you seriously want to invest. So here's the principles, and I call it butterfly gardening, but it's really also very applicable to all types of insects. Uh, even though most people prefer these, just like, you know, while you'll like the birds better, you know, they look nicer, they're, you can almost want to hug a bird. Very few of you want to hug a nice insect, even though I like to every once in a while. Um, so you have to provide food resources for the adults. And very importantly, this means a phenological sequence. And what I mean by that, all you realize there's plants that bloom you know, early, there's flowers that bloom a little later, there's flowers that bloom through the summer, there's flowers that bloom for, in the fall, and their way you ha that way you have to plan your yard to have this persistent phenology of these available food resources for the adults that we call nectaring uh, types of insects. Second, if you really want to provide a habitat in your yard that you can be actually predictable, because most of these insects that use your yard as food resources, they may just be passing through. You know, you may see them today and never see them again for the rest of the summer. Uh, for those of you that really like to have insects persistently and consistently, especially some of these butterflies, well, you're gonna have to have certain food plants available. And so that's another thing that you have to actually plan. And you know, this is Fort Collins, all of you realize, remember last year, uh, how different the trees and the plants, I mean, the daffodils and tulips were blooming. Uh, actually, the daffodils in my yard were over already by this time last year. And you know, for most people, they're starting this year. Remember, all the trees were out uh, much further. So every year is different, and that's another problem. And again, you have to remember, this is, used to be the high plain steppe. And uh, there's a really nice lecture that's given by your leader here who introduced me. And this used to be short grass prairie, and we've created an urban landscape. You know, all the trees you see here, besides a few species, are exotic. All the plants, primarily exotic. Maybe some of you plant uh, rabbit brush. You're lucky to have actually a native plant in your yard. Maybe some of you even plant uh, sunflowers, but even those aren't really the varieties that occur out in nature. So again, uh, you have to provide some shelter. Uh, you know, we do have, uh, like for example, I worked with somebody that had a really nice yard and the insects were awesome. Then came one of those nice hailstorms that some of you are familiar with and no more insects for the rest of the summer. And they were very upset because again, they didn't have the really tight trees like some nice uh, Engelmann spruce or other types of spruce, Colorado spruce were some of these insects could actually enter and try to protect themselves through these storm events. And of course, the last is avoid these harmful insecticides. So again, I want to point out, if you're really interested in this, you need to plan your garden. You need to have a diverse planting. You need to have plants that flower throughout the season. And you need to be, of course, some of you might not be happy with the water bill that you get a little later. And that's one thing we have found, that people that really like these uh, beautiful pictures you see here, 
you know, those plants need water and often need the type of soil preparation that maybe some of you just won't take the time or the expense to prepare. You know, all of you realize some of you are veterans, much, I'm not a gardener, some of you are probably expert gardeners, and you realize the bed preparation is just sometimes uh, very important in terms of sustaining these type of plants over a long period of time. And then, of course, and I'm gonna give you a lot of, there's handouts, I don't know if Sue's gonna pass them out, I'm gonna uh, list a lot of plants, like this slide here, and I just won't have time to discuss each one of them, but there are both annual and perennial plants that you know, are recommended for this area that have a good record for attracting uh, butterflies and other certain insects that I'll show you. And many of you are familiar with these plants, but all of you realize that you know, uh, and I don't have a green thumb. I always get yelled at that, you know, I kill the plants and um, the only ones I'm successful is growing are sunflowers because you don't need anything. You know, they just grow by themselves. But uh, this is one of these things that you have to be really committed for year after year. And of course, you know, some of you are familiar with some of these butterflies. And, uh, and I'll mention later, like, uh, it's become more difficult here in Fort Collins to even have some of these butterflies now in your yard because of a recent invasive, the European paper wasp, because, you know, they, caterpillars are bug burgers, like Dr. Cranshaw likes to say. And uh, many of you watch this wasp, you know, forage, and, you know, sometimes uh, you can have the best planting and literally see no butterflies hardly through the entire summer primarily because of this one insect now that has become very common in Fort Collins. And so perennial plants, uh, you know, I won't mention the names, but you know, you, some of you are familiar with this, uh, these plants, and, uh, and there, some of you might want to contact, you know, CSU Horticulture has that, you know, those beautiful flower gardens. There's various varieties of these plants that do better in Fort Collins in terms of the type of watering regime that you have, the type of maybe soils, you know, that you have in your yard. And again, you have to make that decision. Do I have a more or less manicured yard and I just get to go out there and not worry about my neighbors saying, uh, you know, what's wrong with your yard? How come you can't keep your yard as nice as mine? But you can say, aha, I have three butterflies, you only have one. So I want to make that, sh tell you that what we're telling you here today is not, does not guarantee you to have, you know, go like to the Butterfly Pavilion, some of you have been there, and have, you know, hundreds of gorgeous butterflies and other insects flying around, and you guys just, you know, beep off through the tulips and the other flowers, and, you know, just get your glass of fine wine and sit out there and enjoy it. Um, it's a hard job. In fact, the many yards we've looked at, Dr. Cranshaw and I, you know, very few of them can be considered really successful because there's always something, you know, Murphy's Law, there's a, you know, you have a hailstorm, you have high winds, uh, you have a hot, you know, dry conditions. Uh, for example, last year was not a very good year for a lot of people that had butterfly gardens because, you know, we had a lot more moisture, but we didn't have a much uh, warmer temperature. So a lot of the plants phenologically did not coincide with the insects' life histories, and that becomes a problem too. And here's some other ones. There's a lot of plants you might decide on due to nectar sources. And if some of you are really interested, you know, I have these, uh, uh, a few, I brought, I guess, 25 handouts, not enough. You know, CSU has budget constraints, so uh, I only could do 25 of them. But if some of you are interested, you can contact me, and I'll gladly send you these uh, lists that you can choose from. These are probably the best. Uh, choices that both Dr. Cranshaw and myself have decided or through experience indicated to be very successful in this general area. And uh, so, and these, you know, often are very nice in your yard. Some of you are very familiar with these plants and probably uh, know much more than I would. You know, mass plantings is a much better approach than scattered plantings. And this again, you know, depends on if some of you decide on a perennial garden, you know, sometimes there's an original investment and you have, you know, years of enjoyment. But usually some of the, as you noticed, some of the often suggested plant are annuals, so you'll have to plant those. 
And that often can be at the scale. That's what I wanted to mention is that you can't, like I mentioned here, mass plantings. You can't have, you know, five plants and expect, you know, 25 butterflies to stop by and thank you. You know, uh, they're going to, uh, you know, search wherever there's nectar sources. And that might be, you know, by pure chance they happen to stop by. Uh, and then the typical peak, at least with our experience, should be in the mid to late summer. And imagine how different last summer was from the summer before, and who knows what this summer is going to be. So again, you know, you have to be kind of on the stick, as we say, or I guess on the petiole or on the branch, uh, that you kind of watch this. And if you really want to see the results of your hard work. And then, uh, again, if you can provide some food plants that you can almost develop your own you know, local populations, uh, that would be a, a, a very plus. But again, that's kind of hit and miss. It depends on, you know, what, and I'll show you very quickly some parasitoids or parasites. You know, all these butterflies, all these other insects have other insects that like to feed on them. So you're, you know, you're part of the, uh, you're kind of presenting the, you know, dog-eat-dog -dog world, and you're hoping you have enough time at least to enjoy them. You know, all of you saw that Far Side cartoon where it shows this life cycle, this butterfly, all these trials and tribulations, and finally that beautiful butterfly emerges, and it lands on the first flower, and there's a crab spider that grabs it. And so that's the end of that butterfly. So that's not uncommon. You know, for example, the, how many of you are familiar with the two-tailed swallowtail, one of our tiger swallowtails? That's probably the largest and showiest butterfly in this area. And it, you know, it, the larvae can be found on choke cherry, hop tree, uh, ash, green ash, one of the most commonly planted trees in this area, is a well-known food plant. And some years, like uh, toward the end of the season last year, we had a lot of these butterflies flying around because it was very successful for the caterpillars last year because the uh, European paper wasp kind of got kind of a late start because of the cooler spring. The, uh, the queens had a harder time getting their first workers produced. And so these butterflies actually completed a generation before these paper wasps became a lot more active in their feeding. And then foods used by adults, you know, we've had people that have had great successes of actually providing nectar sources, uh, fruit juices, oozing sap. In fact, you can buy these commercial butterfly feeders and you can make your own little concoction, like keep some beer till it becomes stale. You know, keep some bananas out till they start nice and brown and bruised. And uh, some molasses, mix it all up. And uh, if you can keep the squirrels out of this, you know, uh, and everything else, like your little kid or your dog, uh, you can really, and that's uh, Dr. Cranshaw's slide, I had to borrow it from his butterfly and honeybee visiting droppings. Uh, but if, even if you have dogs in your backyard and you don't pick up your poop, you can do quite well with a lot of butterflies. Um, <laughs> But, uh, the, you know, these butterfly feeders, uh, we know several people that do that, and they're often very successful. But again, remember you're in an urban environment, and you have to sometimes compete. Uh, for example, I have a colleague that his backyard is a, you know, just a, I mean, it's the ultimate backyard when it comes to life. But he also has deer visiting, he has fox, he has uh, all, you know, the, enough fox squirrels to make everybody sad. And then, of course, he has uh, even skunks. So it's hard to you know, keep a lot of this going because you're competing with other wildlife. And remember that if you create your own little sanctuary, then you're also attracting other things besides insects. And uh, this is Dr. Frank, you know, and he finally had it with the foxes when they uh, were playing around in his flower beds and destroyed his flowers you know, when they were wrestling with their uh, to, uh, when the, the cubs and the foxes were all wrestling in his flower beds. But that's something, you know, if you enjoy life, you're going to have to take that defeat. And so, also, uh, a lot of butterflies and other insects like to puddle. So, you know, often damp ground is very advantageous to attracting uh, insects. And so this shows, you know, most of you know why insects puddle. Can anybody tell me why? Are they after the water or are they after something else? Salt, yeah, various nitrogenous compounds, exactly. Uh, so especially people that do a lot of fertilizing, you know, you have lots of nice nitrogenous compounds, you have some, uh, you know, some leaky faucet, or you actually see again, 
this compatibility, you know, how much are you willing to, unfortunately we're in the semi-arid west here, how much are you willing to uh, pay, is the good way of putting it, um, you know, for these beautiful uh, six-legged arthropods. You know, it may not be your, worth your while when you get that water bill. Okay, foods used by caterpillars, their leaves. Uh, so, you know, lots in here. I have just a common list of some of the common butterflies and their common larval hosts. You know, some people, I, we know a couple of people in Fort Collins that do a lot of planting, uh, for example, milkweed and mustards. And uh, like last year, they had one, this one person had a really nice local population of monarchs. And it was really beautiful, you know, go out and see those beautiful striped caterpillars uh, feeding on the milkweed. Uh, they also had uh, lots of other types on the mustards that you can see, a lot of the imported cabbage worm, you know, that's the most common butterfly here. They even had alfalfa out, and they had some of the, what we call the orange sulfur, the, you know, those yellow and orange butterflies, very common, the alfalfa butterfly. So again, uh, it depends, you know, if you plan ahead. And definitely, as Dr. Cranshaw would say, you know, you have to practice the six Ps. If you do this, that's called proper prior planning prevents poor performance. And that's definitely true with this insect gardening. Uh, you know, one lapse, like, okay, I'm going off for a week on a bike ride. I'm gonna come back and hopefully, you know, everything's fine when I come back from a week. Of, on a vacation, well, that might be the end of your attractive garden, as many of you probably had that experience. Uh, like, just a quick life history, uh, you know, the two-tailed swallowtail is a really common insect, uh, especially if you have, you know, choke cherry, ash, hop tree, common backyard plantings. Uh, some of you are familiar with the first instars that are showed here. They even mimic bird droppings. See, I wanted to make sure I talk about birds a little. And then, of course, the ladder caterpillars, uh, are very different, they're red, and, and uh, how many of you ever squeezed one and got those osmoteria to come out? Those are those horns. That's an irreversible gland that actually secretes a, a defensive compound that supposedly protects the caterpillars from uh, predators, especially ants and other insects. So that's actually the uh, taxonomic character to identify swallowtail larvae. And of course, many of them have that eye spot, which is another common defensive type of marking well known in the animal kingdom. And uh, we have lots of people in Fort Collins that have often robust two-tailed swallowtail populations in their trees. But again, then you can't get upset that if you look up in your ash tree or your hop tree that you see leaves that have been chewed on. And so again, you know, you have to have that conflict. Are you willing to accept that if you like insects, they're going to, you know, take their pound of flesh, you might say, and you just have to deal with that. Uh, morning cloak, some of you very, how many of you have already seen that butterfly this year? They overwinter as adults, they become active on warm days, and uh, these often have really nice local populations, especially if you have some of these ornamental elms, uh, aspen, uh, you know, hackberry is a very common food plant, even some of the ornamental willows that are available. And, you know, the caterpillars have these nice, what we call scoli, these nice uh, spines that uh, make them difficult to pick up. But this is a beautiful, you can have several generations produced a summer. And so these are, uh, you know, very common butterfly. And this is a group, the uh, family Nymphalidae, that the adults do not nectar on plants. They feed on uh, exudates or like if you want to do that butterfly feeder. They do not take nectar and pollen uh, mix. They just purely take decomposing, uh, all kinds of decomposing liquids that are resulting from decomposition. So this is, if you want to keep them in your yard as adults, you're going to have to, you know, have some kind of food such as that. Or if you want to keep them uh, persistently, you have to provide some overwintering shelter. And uh, they, some people even have developed these wood piles that they leave out and they, you know, the butterflies crawl between the logs, but then the problem is, you know, that's not a permanent, the wood decays and the wood might bring in other pests. Uh, some of you uh, might not like the carpenter ants that come in, uh, et cetera. Painted lady, uh, how many of you remember, uh, this is a butterfly that does not success overwinter in Colorado but it's, it colonizes each year from uh, southern refugia. So how many of you remember these big flights of painted ladies often in the spring? 
We've had some really large ones here in the past where literally thousands and thousands of butterflies. And they have a wide range of uh, feed, uh, food plants. Uh, some of these are very common in gardens. And often you can have this butterfly almost a uh, year, I mean the entire summer in your yard. Uh, so this is a very uh, common native butterfly. Uh, it's one of the most widespread butterflies in the world. Hummingbird moths. This is a very uh, well-known insect. Um, some of you have seen, that's the white, light, white line sphinx, Hylis lineata, that you see here. That's our most common one. And these next slides are from Dr. Cranshaw. He always likes to show this, uh, another conflict, uh, because the larvae are considered hornworms. And how many of you have ever had tomatoes in your yard and seen these uh, hornworms? This is his famous slide. Uh, again, you know, they are pests. And if some of you try to uh, grow your tomatoes, you might not be happy. Even though, you know, we haven't seen a lot of these in the last years because of the uh, European paper wasp, and they have also lots of other parasitoids. There's tachinid flies, there's even uh, wasps that attack these caterpillars. But if you do get caterpillars like that on your tomato plants, they can do a lot of feeding very quickly. Probably very few of you have ever seen the adult of a, uh, what we call tomato hornworm or Carolina sphinx or five-spotted hawk moth is the proper name for the tomato hornworm. It's rather a drab, but it's very large sphinx moths. They usually fly after, after dark. Uh, you really don't see them like during the day as commonly as you do with the white line sphinx. But it's a conflict. You like that but you might not like the other one. So uh, these are things that you have to make decisions right at the beginning if you're getting involved in insect and butterfly gardening. Uh, so here's the white line sphinx. Sometimes, you know, you've seen these caterpillars cross the road. You know, we've had big, this is another one that doesn't overwinter in Colorado, and the adults fly up from southern refugia and colonize through the summer, and then they're killed back as the frost uh, cycles appear in the fall, early winter. And so sometimes we have large uh, populations of this moth. It's the most common hummingbird moth of Western North America. And there are plants that you can plant specifically to attract these moths. You know, typically these deep kind of throated plants. And uh, some of these are very successful. I know people that just plant petunias just to attract the white line sphinx uh, in the later part of the summer. And four o'clocks are very good. Evening primrose is another very good type of plant. Uh, larkspur, honeysuckle, these ornamental honeysuckles are very good. And that's a long live plant. You know, some of you have some of these ornamental honeysuckles. Sometimes they have hard time surviving during harsh winters. There's a lot of dieback, but uh, they're very successful plants. Another thing, uh, I, the reason I mentioned this, uh, the more action in you have in your yard often, as I've also mentioned, you might get things you don't like, and I've mentioned that before. And how many of you know about the army cutworm, the famous Miller moth? And often the most complaints we have with people that they have this moth that usually, you know, you'll see it end of May, June. It'd be really interesting, uh, the population this year. Uh, last year was very light, and uh, it's sometimes Dr. Cranshaw is often asked to predict you know, what the populations would be like. And I was told him, go to, you know, uh, Central City and do it that way, you know, at least make some money. This is a, a native species, you know, most of you are familiar with the life cycle. The caterpillar is a typical cutworm. You know, we have lots of common cutworm pests that are well known to attack our row crops from corn, wheat, etc. And, you know, the army cutworm can do a lot of damage, especially in winter wheat fields, as shown here. You know, they overwinter as caterpillars, and then the pupae, uh, the uh, larvae emerge during the early parts of the spring, do a little feeding on some of the early weeds. And this is what's really facilitated often this caterpillar to reach uh, good populations or do really well because we've all had these, uh, brought in all these broadleaf weeds like dandelion, plantain. And uh, these are, you know, they turn green, they uh, sprout out very quickly. That's a quick food source. Then they pupate, and then the adults come out in what we know as the famous Miller moth emergences from, uh, depending on the year, end of May, June, sometimes even later. And you've had these in your homes, and some of you don't like them, but you can imagine if you have a yard that's kind of set up for you know, providing the maximum nectar sources, the maximum shelter, 
you'll have a lot more of these moths. And so when they have their annual migration from the plains to the mountains in May and June, and then they return in September, early October, you might have extra problems with them. And they are here to get nectar sources. And maybe some of you have noticed them in your yard, especially they love lilac, you know, some of these early blooming shrubs. And often that really, if you have a yard that's attractive, and I'm not just saying that it looks good, but it's attractive in terms of plant species that provide nectar sources, you might have more of a problem. And just think you're aiding the economy because you're gonna to have to do more dry cleaning of your drapes. Uh, you're gonna to have to maybe have your carpets clean more to get rid of all those carpet beetles that now you have your, in your house because of all the carcasses of the moths that have died under your bed, your dresser, um, et cetera. So, you know, just look at it that way. Uh, and uh, so there's positive and negatives in everything. And here are some, uh, this is from Dr. Cranshaw's list. He's done some really neat work on that. And these are well-known nectar sources. And these are not uncommon plants that are planted in gardens for early flowering, especially prunus. You know, a lot of you have ornamental prune, uh, prunus species, uh, and, uh, and, and also choke cherry. And they're the first plants that bloom. Some of you have other fruit trees in your backyard, apple, etc. And they're often very important uh, resources for these moths. And then these moths have to hang out for a while. So if you have one of these yards that have these beautiful growing pines, spruce, dense evergreen deciduous shrubs, uh, you're going to have a place for these moths to hang out. So this is another dilemma, you know, if you have these refuges or these gorgeous yards. So before I go on, just, uh, I want to make sure that I, I made it very clear that you can do this. And it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's a commitment. And the commitment has, includes two important things, your time and your monetary resources. And so if you're not interested to merge those two, and at the end of the season still be happy, despite you only saw one butterfly and five honeybees, the entire summer, and that still makes you happy, then I urge you to do this. But if that does not make you happy, that you're all mad that this, you know, this egghead told you to plant this beautiful yard, you know, put in your perennials, put in your annuals, do your seasonal progression of the, your plants, your yard, you call the Colorado and over, they might even send a, oh, I shouldn't say that, uh, 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 somebody that actually would take a picture, and, um, but then you see six or seven insects that you really like the entire summer. Uh, you know, that's the chance you'll have to take. But hopefully most of you, you know, say, I did it. That's all that's important. Okay. Uh, other flowering plants, I just wanted to mention, you know, you have lots of other insects. The reason most people focus on butterflies is that they're big, they're beautiful, they make you feel good. You know how much you have a soothing experience when you see one of those beautiful you know, two-tail swallowtails kind of just floating around in your yard. Doesn't that make you, you know, you forget about Washington, D.C. and the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> you just, you're happy. But there are many other insects, and there's been some really neat re, uh, uh, research that has shown that, for example, in backyard, backyard kind of habitats, you often see more bumblebees and honeybees than you do out in surrounding areas that are not as urbanized. And that's because, again, the plants that you present, the nectar sources, and the shelter. And so, of course, you know, the honeybee is an introduced insect. It's not native to North America. Many of you realize that. Brought over, in, uh, you know, already in 1622, I think, in Jamestown. So that's probably even before some of you were born. Okay. I'm not saying anything. I was born right after that. Okay. You know, some of you uh, also have noticed, and a lot of people notice, are some of these beneficial insects like ladybugs, ladybird beetles, uh, parasitic wasps, surfed flies. And I wanted to show you some of these because if you actually garden for butterflies, you'll probably be very successful of bringing in a lot of these other more beneficial insects. But important, and this is where you have to kind of have a little interest in insects. Maybe some of you are not, maybe more of you are, uh, you know, entomophobic than you are entomophilic, uh, but I hope you're not. Uh, but, you know, you need to recognize because, you know, some of these you probably won't be happy with and other ones you will be. So you need to recognize them. 
Okay, and remember, if I give you a quiz, true or false, all ladybird or ladybugs, coccinellids, are good. True or false? False, because you know there's a well-known pest, the Mexican bean beetle is a coccinellid, a ladybird beetle, a major pest of cultivated beans, even here in Fort Collins. Okay, they, you need to provide food needs of the adults. Uh, how many of you purchased uh, the little containers of ladybird beetles from the garden supply stores? and then you were all excited and ran out and released them in your backyard. Three hours later, you came back and you saw one. Well, you know, they are like any animal. They like to eat, you know, and they need to go or they go where they can find their food resources. So again, if you have a yard that's rather pristine, very few aphids or food resources, they're gonna say, I'm out of here. You know, I'm going somewhere where somebody doesn't care or there's some aphids to feed on. And so also you need to think about the immatures and then you pro provide nesting sites. So ladybird beetles, ladybugs, you know, all kinds of names we have. Um, last year was a phenomenal year for the convergent ladybird beetle. That's this one there. How many of you remember the ladybird beetles last year? They were just everywhere. And it's going to be real interesting, you know, they overwinter as adults, our common one, the convergent ladybird beetle. How many of you ever seen the big aggregations? Uh, you can go up in the mountains and sometimes see thousands of them all aggregated for the winter. And so those are the, usually the populations that are harvested commercially. And of course, when those are ready to mate and then leave to find food resources to lay their eggs. So if those food resources aren't in your yard, they're gone, as I mentioned. Uh, we have you know, hundreds of different species of ladybird beetles in Colorado. Uh, some of them are not red with black spots, and you can't tell how old they are by the number of spots. So forget that, if some of you believe in that. Um, and so, but that's the one that's very common. And you know, uh, again, many of you realize the larvae are even very uh, distinctive. Uh, you know, we've had people say, uh, what's this horrible uh, bug here? Uh, do I need to kill it? And we say, no, that's the larvae of the ladybird beetle. Oh, so you know, these are kind of things you have to talk about. So there, see, these are some larvae. Aren't they gorgeous? They're gorgeous insects. Um, and you know, there's their whole life history. You can see the adult, the pupae, and sometimes people see these on their side of their houses and they think they're worried, and a pest control operator tells them that they're eating the, uh, you know, the cement between their bricks, uh, but don't tell her that. Okay, but uh, again, this is an insect that maintains itself as adults on often on nectar and pollen, so often, you know, uh, they, they utilize the same plants that you use to attract butterflies and other insects. Uh, same with these um, surfed flies. How many of you have seen these? These are remarkable mimics of bees and wasps. Remember Hymenoptera, the bees wasps, have four wings. You know, all of us can count to four, so it's very easy. So next time you see a honeybee, see if you can see the four wings. Even though they connect the hind wing to the fore wing, so it's one flying surface when they do the downstroke, the power stroke. You know, butterflies and moths do that too. Only dragonflies, you know, independently move their fore and hind wings. Uh, all other insects, you know, couple, have a coupling device that they have one, you know, uh, flying surface. But these flies have only, uh, they only have one pair of wings. And of course, uh, also hymenopter bees and wasps, they have long segmented antennae. These have little bristle-like antennae. We call them a wristate. So it's not that difficult. And uh, again, our, probably our most common surfed fly we see in our yard is this one right here, one of the Aristala species. The larvae is known as the rat tail maggot. And it's another introduction. You know, many, some of these uh, insects were brought in. Uh, incidentally, others were brought in. You know, like many surfids are important aphid. Uh, you know, they feed on aphid larvae, uh, aphids. And the larvae have, uh, and the, that species actually have been commercially available. So here shows, you know, one of the larvae feeding on aphid colony, uh, et cetera. And you can see they're pretty neat. Uh, probably most of you won't get excited with the maggot, because uh, remember, <laughs> the, the lowest life on this planet, you know, Aristotle had his scale ladder of perfection, and people were on top, and the maggot and the worm was at the bottom. So if somebody calls you a maggot, take that seriously. Um, <laughs> So this is another very common insect, uh, but again, you know, if you have a rather pristine yard, uh, you make a lot of efforts to make sure you don't, see that's again the conflict. 
you know, what do you do when you see your favorite plant being overwhelmed by colony and aphids? Do you hold back, you know, like this, I'm not going to control these aphids, I'm going to let nature take its course, and then you find out the plant has died, and then you start using your four-letter uh, word vocabulary, because that was one of your nicer plants, and now the aphids have killed it, because you thought these native controls or these natural controls will do the job. You know, again, uh, you know, you're taking a risk, uh, but it's the joy at the end. And uh, a lot of them, as I mentioned, mimic the honeybee, as you can see, uh, very nice uh, insects. And like, for example, there's over 1,200 different species in North America of that family, Surfidae, and we have probably 400 here in Colorado. So there's lots of different species. Like I always tell young people, if I ask you to do a collection of all the insects that occur in Fort Collins, around Fort Collins, it'd probably take you five to eight years to collect all of them, maybe three to four years longer to identify them, if, even if you could. And then um, by that time, you've probably lost interest or you're in a nursing home like myself. <laughs> uh, or you're, in, or you know, if somebody tells you to catch all the different fish around Fort Collins, you knew where to go, you could do it in one afternoon. So, you know, it's a different scale, again, that you're talking about. And again, you know, you can surely plant the flowers, some of these I've mentioned, that will attract these insects. And so hopefully some of you will do this summer and go out and see these, you know. And now with a digital camera, even a mental midget like myself can take a picture. You know, how many of you remember those Nikons, you know, where you click, 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 and you ran in, and then you got your film back, and not one good picture was among the big stack. Now, you, you know, anybody can take a picture. Some of you are interested. Um, you know, you can email, uh, even though I get maybe five to ten a day. Uh, you know, that's one of the problems now with the digital camera. You can easily load it up and then put it as an attachment to an email and send it and say, what is this? And then, you know, some of us have to respond. But, um, you know, I gladly do that if some of you are concerned, because, you know, that will make you more interested in doing this, is knowing what you have. You know, you're just not interested in having bugs. And remember, a bug is not a good name to use anyway, because some of you have been sick with a bug. Uh, some of you have had a bug in your computer. Uh, there's only one order of insects that are called true bugs. That's the order of Hemiptera, and they have piercing, sucking mouth parts that arise from the front of the head, back of the head, or in the middle between the front legs. So they're very different. Okay. And adult flowers, you know, adult flower flies sustain themselves on nectar and pollen. That's why you can get lots of them in your yard. This is one of the more common insects. We've done some surveys that you'll see in your yard if you have that progression of nectar sources throughout the season. How many of you have seen lace wings? Another very common insect, you can even commercially uh, uh, purchase these, especially for glass house, greenhouse biocontrol. We have uh, several common species here in the Fort Collins area. They do really well in kind of a, a mixed garden uh, setting where you have also uh, you know, a good amount of trees. Uh, many of these are associated with uh, certain soft-bodied insects that are associated with coniferous trees, uh, deciduous trees, and you know, some of them are aphid. They're called aphid lions, the larvae. And they also sustain themselves, maintain themselves on nectar resources. And uh, in fact, one of the more common one is Chrysoperla coloradoensis. Isn't that a great name? Found in Colorado. And some of you have seen, how many of you have seen their eggs? Isn't that cool? They lay their eggs on the edge of a stalk. So for example, an ant can't walk around and uh, eat a grape. You know, they, uh, the length is really neat. Usually high enough for an ant can't get to the egg and eat it. There's all kinds of wasps. How many of you have already seen some wasps out? Many of these wasps, overwinter as adults, and some of these are what we call parasitoid. You know, how many of you have been called a parasite? That's <laughs> different. Uh, uh, don't be called a parasitoid because you kill your host. Uh, that's the difference. You know, some of you, probably one out of 12 of you might have follicle mites right there in your eyebrow. That's pretty cool. And um, those are true parasites. You know, they have a long uh, relationship with you, whereas a parasitoid kills its host. And a lot of these are well established in yards, especially if you have these other insects. But again, you have to kind of understand that you give a little and they take a lot sometimes. You know, that sometimes you see your beautiful caterpillars, you're all excited, and suddenly they're gone, and you find them kind of shriveled up below the plant, 
and they just, you know, they've been parasitized by one of these parasitoid wasps. And we have thousands of these species in Colorado. Nobody knows. And, uh, and even if the Lord knows, he's not telling us. Okay. And uh, you, sometimes you see these aphid mummies that they uh, create by their feeding uh, up in the uh, corner, up, up in the upper part of the slide. Uh, and we've had people come in and say, ooh, what's this cool aphid? And you say, no, that's a dead aphid. Uh, uh, that's an aphid that's been parasitized by one of these parasitoid wasps. How many of you have seen these beautiful tachinid flies? Uh, if you've been walking, especially on rabbit brush, that neat one, Adagenia vitrex, the one, isn't that, the scientific name's great. Uh, that's the upper one, the orange one. That's what, you know, that one, they don't even know really what their major caterpillar hosts are. Many of these tachinid flies attack lepidopter larvae. And again, you see the conflict. You know, you can't have the cake and eat it too. You can't have a butterfly house, you know, where you keep all the parasites, predators. And Dave's going to talk about these things called birds. And, you know, birds do like to eat caterpillars. And uh, Dave's made a career out of watching birds eat insects. And he'll show you some uh, slides. So again, if you want a lot of birds in your backyard, you're going to have to give up you know, having a lot of insects probably in your backyard. And here's the tachinid eggs. Uh, even on a stink bug, they attack all kinds of different insects. And again, generally, small accessible flowers are most commonly used by these natural enemies of garden pests. So, uh, if some of you are interested, you know, we can gladly tell you which ones to plant. But how many of you have planted your flowers and they never came up the way you wanted them? That's another thing you're going to have to accept. You know, uh, it's a long-term process to get that experience, to get that perfect or a near-perfect butterfly or insect garden. And here are some useful plants that provide food for uh, adult stages of insect uh, predators and parasitoids. Uh, many of you are familiar with these uh, type plants. Uh, you know, they're very efficient in providing that for, uh, food resource. Uh, again, if any of you are interested, you can contact myself or Dr. Cranshaw, and we can provide you uh, or suggest to you which plants to plant. But again, uh, before you ask, make sure that you're set. You know, you, okay, I'm willing to put this much effort in my flower beds. I'm willing to tolerate this much of a water bill. I'm, uh, and then again, you know, if you have a nice, you know, I think the best life form on this planet is a dog because they're the only life form with a true grace. They give you, they love you regardless. But if you have a big dog, you know, sometimes uh, flower uh, beds aren't exactly, you know, uh, they don't last all summer. And so, um, again, you have to make sure you know the conflicts before you start. Uh, and here's some of the food, you know, again, you know, how many of you would really tolerate your plants being infested by aphids? How many would you do that? You know, again, not very many of you. Uh, I did want to mention the European paper wasp. Uh, anybody been stung by one? It's a great experience. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't hurt too much. On uh, Whitney Cranshaw, some of you saw his talk at Audubon Society. I think this is, he had that scale of stinging pain. This one's not too bad, but this has really changed the landscape of insects in backyards. The adult uh, wasps, the workers, are so efficient predators that I can't remember uh, in the last years when somebody's brought me a nice plump hornworm larvae, tomato hornworm, and asked me what it was. Uh, they're so efficient of uh, reducing these caterpillars in your yard. And as, uh, you know, the young bug burger, they chew up these caterpillars and feed it to their uh, brood. So this is another, you know, and we're continuously going to have these new insects. Uh, you know, now the uh, elm flea weevil is becoming very common in Colorado. That's a new invasive. The large yellow underwing, it's another type of cutworm, it's becoming common in Colorado. So each, you know, we're going to get, uh, like E.O. Wilson said, we're going to be a planet of weeds. And if you don't mind weeds in your backyard, both plants and animals, then you're going to do well. Uh, so here's the paper wasp, the gnaws. Uh, some of you will have maybe yellow jackets. We often see that, uh, you know, often in these very diverse yards, you might have more of a yellow jacket problem because you're going to have more friable soils that, or like you have rocks or uh, wood type uh, edging. 
and they, uh, there are more uh, types of areas that these wasps build their underground nests in, and you'll have to deal with that. So there's all these conflicts that occur, and I'm not trying to discourage you. I think she's gonna run me out here, but I want you to be realistic that you know this is a wonderful, and I think all of you should do it, and then come back next year, and I won't be here because I know what you're gonna tell me. So if some of you, I'm done here, if some of you are interested in um, plants, uh, it's kind of cut off there, uh, well in the back, that's uh, heavily uh, visited by honeybees. Uh, there's a nice list. This is a survey that Whitney did, and these have been shown regionally in this area to be very, very good. And the honeybees making a little comeback, you know, some of you realize because of the varroa mite uh, in some of the, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Cranshaw doesn't like to talk about the colony collapse disorder problem, but uh, you know, there's the honeybees coming back, and um, there are a lot of native bees. I wish I had more time, you know, there's, uh, and then if some of you are interested in water gardens, how many of you have water gardens here? Some of you, that's a wonderful uh, a way to enjoy insects in your yard. Some of you are interested in having dragonflies, you know, certain other insects that are social beetles, bugs. Uh, water gardens, we have, a, uh, we have a publication, Dr. Cranshaw and I put out, that allows you to uh, see which insects are in your water garden. You can contact the experiment, uh, extension service, you can get a copy of it. And, um, but again, you know, you have to tolerate, well, uh, uh, you know, there's certain things that, if some of you have water gardens, you realize that uh, you might have potential having a little mosquito population now in your backyard. And they're often the Culex mosquitoes that are well-known vectors of West Nile. So there's conflicts with that too. And I think I'm done. And I do want to thank Dr. Cranshaw. And that's his book, if some of you are interested, is Garden Insects. And uh, he's welcome. Uh, buy his book. He'll thank you for it. First of all, it's neat to give a talk that's not about the pine beetle. Um, that was my deal for 32 years, so. I'm glad to not have to talk about the pine beetle. And following Boris is uh, impossible, but it's an honor. But I've always been interested in birds since I was a little kid, and I just couldn't figure out how to get paid for it. So uh, now that I'm retired, I can, I can look at birds a little more. For me, I saw a bird eat a particular insect one time. I distinctly remember when this was, and I wondered if anybody had ever written down that an orange crown warbler eats a box elder leaf roller and that was my first food record i guess uh, formal food record in my journal and i started writing down these little combinations of things i saw this eat this on this date in this place and my journals quickly became full of these things hundreds of them and um, I got in near car wrecks backing up on I-25 to see what the crow, what kind of rabbit or vermin was the crow eating in the median. Uh, semis bombing past me, uh, my wife screaming, what are we doing? Uh, but anyway, it's fun. And uh, so now my kind of my hobby within my hobby of birding is to see what they're eating. and. Uh, so that kind of goes with what we're talking about tonight. And, you know, why, why is Colorado a place where people like Boris and Whitney and I can work our whole lives and be underpaid and not leave? <laughs> because of this diversity, because of the creatures have got us captured. We, we're not leaving because this is an awesome place. And I imagine for a lot of you, that's why you live here, is because of the natural uh, beauty and diversity. And so if you look at, our state, it's centrally located. The only bad thing about Colorado in my mind is that we don't have an ocean, uh, a beach, a, an o ocean front, but if, you know, we're 15 hours away from that, so you, you can get your fix every once in a while. But otherwise, we've got a little bit of east, west, north, and south. We've got this tremendous uh, elevational diversity, um, a lot of different habitat types. We've got desert, we've got alpine, and everything in between. Um, we've got amazing weather. If you're into weather, this is a great place to be. Just go out to Lyman and look up and, and, and you'll be entertained uh, in the summer anyway. Uh, a lot of public land. You can walk off the road and, and not be trespassing. 
and uh, lots of riparian habitats, which of course for wildlife, that's where the real concentrations, the, the real concentration, the real migration corridors are usually in riparian areas. So um, we should take care of our water um, in, in this part of the world, it's precious. So diversity of habitat is what makes this an amazing place uh, in the wilds of Colorado. And to the extent that you can kind of mimic that in your yard, think of your yard as a little uh, miniature version of Colorado and you need to mimic the diversity, the, the habitat, the essential requirements of a habitat, um, you're gonna have wildlife. And I think Boris did a great job of pointing out the realities of all this, that, that there are pluses and minuses that you have to be tolerant of less than perfection. And, uh, but if you are willing to put up with some blemishes, if you, you and your partner in your house uh, aren't at such total odds that one of you wants perfection, the other wants uh, cool critters, and you would get a divorce over the difference, um, you know, I, I like what he said about go for it, just go for it realistically. Um, so, you know, a habitat, just to be real basic, you have to have some, some basic things and food, water, and cover. Uh, some people call the nesting shelter the fourth requirement. Uh, some people lump that in with cover. But you've got to have these things, uh, you know, a, a species has to have these things in fairly close proximity or it's not going to spend very long in your yard. Now, it might get two of them in your yard and one across the fence or in the open space uh, out the back, uh, on the back 40 there, but it's got to have all those things or it's not going to stay. And the birds that we have in our, you know, you can break them down in, into these different categories roughly uh, based on when they spend their time here. And a lot of birds are what we call resident birds. They're here all year round. And if you think about it and, and the key role that feeding, that food plays in all this, for a bird to live here all year round, it probably changes lifestyles a little bit. It probably eats insects in the summer and maybe eats seeds or fruits in the winter. So if you see a bird species 12 months of the year in your yard, it's probably uh, not a specialist in terms of feeding. It probably is able to shift gears, uh, diversify its feeding habits, not super picky. It's a, uh, you know, like a 13 year old. Uh, doesn't care, just put something down there and I'll eat it. Migrants are birds that we only see during transition from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds. Uh, spring and autumn is when we usually see those kind of birds here. Uh, of course, we have some species that are only here in the summer and some that are only here in the winter. My mom was one of those people that thought you go birding on a nice 70 degree day and you know, that's a good day to go birding. And I don't think she realized that you know, every day is a good day to go birding. You just are going to see a different set of things and you have to go about it a little differently. But, um, you know, that's why people, that's why birding is probably the number one sport in the United States or, or the world is because there's the right number of species. They're colorful. You can see them all year round. Uh, you can attract them to your yard and bring them close to you. And uh, there's no secret why birds, there's more birders than there are buggers. Um, buggers are too little. I've always said if, if uh, a cuckoo wasp was the size of a Volkswagen, people would pay money to go see it. But they're so little, they're in holes in trees, uh, people are afraid they might sting them. Uh, there are a lot of reasons So we've been brainwashed by our grandma or our mom or something that bugs are to be stepped on and, uh, and then you have to, to identify them. You've got to squish their genitals and get a microscope and all these uh, things that people don't want to do or don't know how to do. So it's easy to see why birds are, are, are the one that, that the most watchers settle into. But here's some examples of the species that we see in Fort Collins that are year round. You know, great horned owl and the red tailed hawk and, and these others. And uh, they're, they're kind of the staples. When you go out and take a two hour walk or an hour walk on the river uh, all year round, you're gonna see some of that list right there and maybe most of that list. So those are our, get to be our friends, kind of the the anchor points of the world, and then we can kind of see what else is going on uh, in the way of change. Um, I want to mention the robin, and I say it's an urban legend because somewhere, somebody taught us that the robin goes away. 
and it comes back in the spring. And I guarantee you, somebody in this room has already said it in the last week. I saw the first robin of spring. Don't be the one that says that because they're here all the time. I, I remember distinctly two years ago in December, standing in Grandview Cemetery and watched 850 robins fly over the cemetery, heading somewhere northwest to roost at night. And I always wonder where that is, over by Laporte or Bellevue or somewhere. There's a huge robin roost in the winter. In large measure, that urban legend might have gotten a start before we started planting things that caused them to linger. But now we have lots of berries, lots of multiflora rows, lots of things that they can sustain themselves on. And when there's not uh, worms to be had in unthawed ground, there's other things, and most of those other things are things that we've planted. So uh, maybe you're to be excused if you're the one that said you saw the first robin of spring because it might have been true in your, in your youth, but it's not true now. Migrant birds, uh, for most birders, these are the ones that get our blood going because they might be unusual. They might be from back east, they might be from far, far away, they might these off-course lost tourists are the ones that we want to see the most because they are unusual. And uh, so migration time is a special time if you're a birder. Even though I like to go out in the winter and find birds, I will admit to you of sitting inside on a snowy day thinking about warblers or, uh, oh man, I don't know if I can wait till April or May. It's, I know it's coming. Maybe I should get an RV and go to Scottsdale or uh, do something <laughs> smart people do in the winter. <laughs> I'm starting to get this uh, snowbird business, but uh, it's, it's because of these, seeing these special birds. Summer only birds, uh, a lot of these, you know, nest around Fort Collins, maybe not right in town, but if you live in La Porte or up against the foothills, you're gonna see some of these nesting. You know, the osprey seems to be a special bird in Fort Collins because of the efforts that this town made to establish them. They hacked them out. They basically raised populations in hopes that they would imprint on this area, go away, and, and come back each year to Fort Collins. And they, they brought birds in. The Division of Wildlife in the city of Fort Collins uh, Natural Areas Program w was part of that. And uh, I saw my first osprey the other day. Some of you may know that there's a special event going on in the cemetery. Um, and it's not a funeral. It's a birth and that is the birth involves some birds called white winged crossbills and they are nesting in the cemetery and um, i never dreamed when i first saw these birds last november that i would be living in the cemetery basically ever since following these birds but i pretty much have and i have to say it's been one of the most uh, fun experiences to really intimately follow two individual birds for 130 days uh, I haven't been there every day, but I've been there more than, more than 80 days. And uh, they are nesting. They're not supposed to nest there. They, they started nesting uh, a couple, three weeks ago. Uh, the babies were born um, about on March the 12th. So, and they're going to be fledging, leaving the nest on about April 12th. So. Things happen quickly in the bird world, but um, it, it's really fun. And one of the reasons why I would think um, you might enhance your yard for birds is the opportunity just to look at, look at well a few individual birds and really learn them. You don't have to have 150 species of birds in your yard over your lifetime. Um, and, and I'm telling you this by experience, if, if you get into it, two birds can provide you uh, amazing uh, entertainment and your nature fix and everything else, and you might even learn some new information. Uh, here's some examples of uh, winter birds that we see in, in Fort Collins, and some of those are really special, very interesting birds. You know, everybody thinks of Christmas counts as the one day in the winter when you go out and get back into birds, but to me, Christmas counts are a diversion, uh, something you gotta do to get back to the to real looking at birds. There's plenty to be seen in the winter, and to think that there aren't any birds or there aren't any life in the winter 
even if it's insects, is not true. My favorite thing about birding is, is this issue of food. And if you watch birds long enough, you'll realize that everything they do is pretty much related to food or sex. Uh, there's a little bit of what, you, what they call maintenance or cleaning up or preening or getting ready for eating or sex. But it's mostly about those two things. And you know, that's not a bad way to spend your life, food or sex, I mean, that's not bad. What we're talking about here mostly is enhancing your yard from a food standpoint so that you can have the birds come to your yard and maybe stay there long enough that you can watch them or photograph them or whatever it is that you want to do. I think there's a lot of ho more hope th with birds than there is insects in uh, eliminating major conflicts, although you are going to have some conflicts with, with this one too. Th this is a little bird I photographed in uh, New Hampshire called a yellow-bellied flycatcher. The reason I took the picture was because it was close enough to photograph, but when I looked at it, I noticed something unusual, and uh, flycatchers rarely eat flies. They mostly eat wasps, and so they should be really called wasp catchers or bee catchers, but this one's got a fly in its mouth, so this is an exceptional uh, flycatcher. Of course, insects are most important to birds in the summer. A lot of them are referred to as insectivores, and the reason they migrate is not because it gets cold here in the winter, it's because there are no easily accessible insects. But every once in a while, you'll see one of these tropical birds or breed birds that we think of as being temperate climate birds that migrate out of here in the winter, trapped up here in December, and they're doing just fine, hunting around on windowsills and scrounging here and there, and they're finding things. It's not that they can't exist. I mean, a chickadee is a little dinky bird that loves cold weather. It's not the size or, or the delicateness of the bird that makes them leave because of cold. They're leaving because they don't have enough food here. And uh, if they're an insectivore, they're probably gone. This is an example of an insect, and Boris talked about tolerance, tolerate a little bit of chewed leaves, tolerate some blemish. There are all kinds of insects. I, I used to give a lot of talks to arborists, uh, the green industry, the pest control people, and I was considered nuts by some of them because I told them to not spray certain things or that you will be respected by your clientele if you actually told maybe they call you to kill something and you say we don't need to kill that in the long run they'll respect you for that and uh, you will be more professional and more environmentally uh, responsible if you do it that way and and they say i have bills to pay i got kids to feed uh, it's my job uh, to kill stuff and uh but I think, I think that mentality carries over to a lot of homeowners. A lot of ways, those guys are just doing what people ask them to do. Uh, just like Smokey the Bear was invented by people who said, we don't like fires. So Smokey got really good at talking about fire prevention when fire was really a benevolent force in the forest in a lot of situations. And I think in, in, in some measure, that mentality of a pest control guy showing up to kill things was um, he's just doing what people are asking him to do and, and willing to pay for. So this is an example to me of an insect that maybe some people would want to control because it made their leaves look tarnished or deformed or whatever with these galls. But the insects that come in and make those galls and then come out of those galls are very, very important to migrating birds in spring and fall. This hackberry nipple gall, psyllid, you pronounce that word psyllid, they're a little very tiny little aphid-sized um, insects that look like a little cicada. But they're coming to the, the buds in the spring, laying eggs on those buds. The, buds, the, the, the uh, eggs hatch, the nymphs develop inside the leaves and cause the formation of that gall. And I refer, usually refer to galls as little insect pinatas. And you know, we bust them open, there's an insect inside of them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of birds eat those galls in the summer, squirrels eat them. And then in the fall, they come out of the galls, and it, it coincides perfectly with spring and fall migration of the small uh, passerin birds, some of the birds we want to see the most. And so if you go to a park and you know your trees, and this is something I always get upset with birders about, is they know the intimate life cycle and the plumage molts and all this complicated stuff about a, a gull, like a herring gull that takes four years to reach from its full cycle of different plumages 
Uh, they know that forwards and backwards and couldn't tell you the difference between a maple tree and an elm tree. You've got to learn your trees if you want to know your birds. You've got to know your plants. And uh, you've got to know your plants if you, know, you want to know your insects. Same thing. But this one, if, if you go into a park in spring or fall and you know where the hackberry trees are, I will predict that that's where most of the action is going to be because of those little psyllids and the birds are going to be there nitpicking, getting those little things. And uh, I watched one, one warbler during my lunch hour one day at Grandview Cemetery and I calculated up at the rate that he was pecking and I went back after work at 6 o'clock and he was still there in the same tree pecking at about the same rate. And I calculated out he ate 10,000 of those psyllids in one day. And that's the kind of thing that birds are doing out there in the landscape. And they will be natural controls for a lot of insects. And if you can lay off the chemicals, I, I would venture to say that a lot of those insects Boris talked about, the parasitic wasps and the surfed flies and, and the birds are going to do a reasonable job of bringing the populations down to where you can tolerate them if you're not expecting perfection. You know, if you can get to the point where I don't expect every leaf to look like Safeway, where they've got little rain showers every 20 minutes and everything is polished and perfect and lined up in little uh, pyramids, the apples are just perfect. I mean, if you can tolerate a hole once in a while and a chewed thing, and a little frass, um, this is going to work good and you will be entertained in your own yard. Aphids are very, very important to a lot of birds. So between the ladybird beetles and the birds, I think most of the time they're going to be knocked down to where the plant won't die. Like Boris said, if you can just grit your teeth and let them do it, occasionally you'll lose a plant, but most of the time you won't. And it'll be ladybird beetles and birds that come to the rescue. And one of the things, a lot of people contact Boris or me or Whitney and say, you know, we got all these yellow jackets buzzing around our trees, what's going on? Well, they're coming to the tree to feed on the sugary excrement of the aphids, the honeydew, and a lot of things come to that sugar. A lot of things that you don't like, maybe yellow jackets, it's either your Pepsi or it's your tree, or it's something good like a cedar waxwing that likes the sugar. You just have to kind of let it fl go, let it flow and see what happens and enjoy the ride is the way I would say most of this wildlife stuff goes. You can, you can set it up, give them a shot, and then just see what happens, I think is the best way to go. And if you've got a plan that it has to come out this way, you're going to be disappointed. So regarding the, the insects in your landscape, I would say you got to recognize what's a true pest. Mountain pine beetle is a true pest. It will kill your pine tree if it's there in enough numbers. A hackberry psyllid is a blemish. Tolerate it and watch the birds eat them. And then realize that this ugly thing over here that you thought was a pest is a larval ladybird beetle and it's a beneficial. You, you don't have to put a scientific name on them, but, you, but it's good if you could say most of the things in your yard, that's a pest, that's a battle I'm going to choose to go, go after because uh, in my mind a pest is something capable of killing a plant. That's an aesthetic, cosmetic kind of thing, and that's a good one. That's a beneficial. And if you can just put them in those kind of categories, I think you'll be a lot better off and be able to live with, with the issues. So minimize pesticide use. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that all pesticides are horrible and that we, it isn't something that society has to use once in a while, but I think it's overdone. Seek objective information. Don't go to a company that makes money off of killing things and ask them if this should be killed. They will tell you it, it does. Go to Whitney Cranshaw, go to your extension agent, go to a master gardener, uh, get second opinions, go to the state forest service, get help with this stuff. That's why Boris gets paid, he gets paid to identify about a third of what he actually does and he'll do the other two thirds just because he's a nice guy. Make these people use their training and if you don't know what it is, get some in a bottle and take it to somebody. Figure it out and you might learn, okay, that's a beneficial, you don't need to worry about it. Or that's a neutral, it doesn't do anything positive or negative in most social systems, so just ignore it. That one, better deal with it. That's, what, that's why you go to those people. But when in doubt, just be tolerant. These are all plants, and I've got some on there that are maybe surprising. Russian olive has got a bad name, but um, I always say that Russian olive is 60% bad and 40% good. And when I go birding, I look at Russian olives because I've seen some amazing birds in Russian olive. Uh, I wouldn't plant one, I wouldn't, you know, I think some of these projects to eliminate them in riparian areas are 
solid. I don't know how realistic they are given how the head start the Russian all have had, but all those things right there are major bird foods and sort of like what Boris was saying with having flowers that bloom throughout the warm season, uh, I would say the same thing for plants that have fruits. You don't want to just plant all choke cherries and they're present in abundance in August and the birds scarf them up and then there's no nothing for the whole winter. So mix it up, have crab apples that have small fruits and big fruits and they'll eat the big ones first and the little ones have to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and they'll be eaten in, in March. You know, hawthorn, just mix it up so that you've got that smorgasbord laid out there for a long period of time. All these trees are wonderful bird trees. And I, I say this from experience of watching birds and what trees they're in. And the reason they're in those trees is either the insects that are in those trees or the seeds or the fruit or the cones, whatever it is on, on those trees. And one thing you need to realize is that trees, uh, most trees have male and female flowers on the same tree. Therefore, if you buy one of those, you're gonna have the seeds or the fruit on every one of those individual trees that you buy. Some trees have the male and the female are segregated. And if you buy a male tree at the nursery, you're never gonna see any fruit on that tree or seeds. And some people want that because those aren't as messy. You know, we, we market Marshall seedless ash so it, it doesn't have the mess. You don't have to rake up as much. Marshall seedless ash, it's a male ash tree. So, you know, realize what you're getting and if they can tell you at the nursery which, which sex the, of the tree it is or if it's one of those trees that has both flowers on the same tree, uh, then you kind of know what to get in the way of uh, food requirements for birds down the road. But I remember we had to design a windbreak to plant along Pena Boulevard to keep snow off a DIA that would not attract wildlife that would get in the engines of the planes. And it was sort of thinking backwards for most of the windbreaks we designed. We designed a windbreak to provide shelter for livestock, for wildlife, to protect roads and have fruits and, 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 and so on for wildlife. And this one was a planting that would not attract wildlife. So we were trying to find sources of male trees uh, basically sterile kind of trees that we could plant out there that would do the mechanical job of protecting the road and not attract any wildlife that might conflict with the air, aircraft. Here's some more woody plants that are very good in this part of the world for birds. And again, that's on the handout. It'll be on the city website. But all these things uh, do well around here and are great for birds. Um, this is one that maybe you haven't thought of, but maples, this time of year, the sap is rising in the tree and it tends to leak out of the branches and the buds and little cracks and crevices. Hour after hour, I've been standing in the cemetery w waiting for the crossbills to do something I could write down. I, w I watched this one silver maple tree and it's amazing how many birds and the fox squirrels utilize that tree and go along the branch licking the sap that's leaking out. And overnight, when we have a 50 degree day and a 28 degree night, those little icicles will form, the sap will form these little icicles, and the next morning the birds are right there dripping, getting that drip. And I took some photographs the other day of one of the icicles, and guess what color it was? Brown, it was maple syrup brown. And uh, I don't think it's just water they're getting, I think they're getting sugar water. And so maples is a really good plant for that reason. You know, a lot of you probably are into feeders. You probably heard Kevin Cook and other people say the same thing, that feeders are not for the birds, they're for you. They're so that you can see them up close and enjoy them better. They don't need your feeder. Uh, once you get them hooked on your feeder, then maybe you've got to follow through on it because some birds are brought into our area and retained because of feeders. But in general, think of them, they, they don't need you. That may upset you, but... Uh, they might need you when it's 20 degrees or zero degrees on a windy, snowy day and they've got nowhere else to go, but most of the time they don't need your feeder. And the one thing I wanted to mention is, is safflower as an underrated food at feeders. Everybody talks about black oil, sunflower seeds and thistles. Safflower has some advantages. Squirrels don't like it. A lot of the blackbirds and birds that we don't want to come in and dominate our feeders don't like it. So maybe safflower is the answer. It's not gonna be for goldfinches or little tiny things, but 
Uh, for the bigger birds that we generally like, safflower is pretty attractive to them, and uh, usually squirrels don't go to it. And squirrels seem to dominate everything we do in outdoors. <laughs> I, I'm impressed at Grandview Cemetery looking at that day after day. That ecosystem is dominated by fox squirrels. They're dominating the architecture of the trees. They're dominating the use of the holes. They're dominating, they're chasing things. They're eating pizza out of the dumpster. They're, they're doing everything. And uh, so it's a fox squirrel world, like it or not. And most of the birders I know hate fox squirrels. I've always said I like them. If they mess up the crossbill nest, uh, I might change my mind about squirrels, but remember that they will inherit the earth I put this thing up there about my grandpa because he hated them, and he lived in northern New Jersey. It was the eastern gray squirrel. One day he declared war on gray squirrels, all right, and my grandpa was in World War I, and he, he, he knew how to fight. He started trapping them. He took them out to this Jockey Hollow State Park 10 miles away from his house, and at exactly 100, he gave up. At 100, he gave up. He waved his white handkerchief right out in the yard, and he said, you win. He saw as many as he ever saw, and they just, he'd take them out, and they'd fill in, and that is a lesson to us all that probably that's the same way it's going to be here. Catching a few isn't going to solve your squirrel problem in your yard. Water features, I mean, this is a really important, you know, the yards that really attract a lot of wildlife their trick, if you will, is usually a water feature. They've got a heater in the winter to keep it unthawed. They've got the right location for it. They've got a little drip to it. They keep it clean. Uh, all those things are important. And just sticking an old ratty bird bath out there and leaving it for months on end without ever changing it, cleaning it, filling it is probably not all that helpful. Uh, one thing I've seen at the cemetery is when I'm standing there, there's a pump house over in the corner and it has a little pipe that drains water. It's a flat roof building and the, and the snow collects up there and then melts and drips out this pipe. This pipe is in the shade, it's a steady drip, and you would not believe the steady progression of birds coming to that dripping pipe. You know, both nuthatches, mountain and black capped chickadees, siskins, all these birds are coming there just like making runs every minute and a half or so. I thought, man, that's the way water features ought to be. A drip in the shade, kind of back in there and hidden with a bush on this side in the building over here. They can sneak in there, get their drink and get out and not be a sitting duck for a sharp shin hawk. What do we do? We put a flat saucer with algae water out in the sun and wonder why nothing's in it. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the drip connotates clean to them, maybe the shade and the the closeness of shrubs where they can zip in and zip out of there and not be real conspicuous, maybe that's a big part of it. But I, I wanna mention that the state is getting real picky. You wanna build a pond in your backyard and, and collect water. You can't even have a rain barrel in this state legally. Kansas won the court battles over our water and the, the state is cracking down on, on if you divert water from a, a flowing stream. If you got a well, okay, but if you're diverting water from a stream, you technically have got to have permission to do that and the rights to do that, and you could be busted for it. By, so if you have any doubts about you're building a pond and you're spending a lot of money to line it and all this stuff, before you do it, you better call the water office and make sure you're okay with that. Some of you probably know Larry Griffin, maybe Larry Griffin's even here, but he's got this fantastic yard in South Fort Collins and he's got this huge pond with lily pads and he uh, bought this wonderful dragonfly sculpture that's about, I don't know, five feet across. And here's the black crown knight here and sitting on Larry's dragonfly fishing in his pond and that's kind of like, is this real? Is this really Fort Collins? And this guy's, this is your backyard? I can't believe it. But. So some people have that kind of a yard and you know, most of us don't. Brush piles is another big one. You know, you hear about if I build a brush pile, maybe I'll get sparrows or I'll get something rare in the winter. If you're gonna build a brush pile, big it way, build it way bigger than you think. Build it as big as a Volkswagen. I mean, throw piles and piles of stuff out there and realize that decay happens and it's gonna go down and you need to keep adding to it or it won't be a brush pile very long. So build it big, throw in big coarse limbs, little limbs, have some air spaces in there, make it diverse and you'll have, you'll have some sparrows and you'll have some bird action in your brush pile. And like Boris was talking about, 
plantings in, in clumps, not single plants. I mean, if, if you can put the whole one corner, of your, one back corner of your yard into brush pile, that'll be a, a good feature. It might have deer mouse, it might have a skunk once in a while, part of the deal. But you will have sparrows, and if you throw some millet and stuff out there near the edge of that, they'll run out and go back in there, and you'll have some action in the brush pile. Uh, nest materials. There's a lot we can do by, and the guys will probably like this the most because a lot of the do list things, the tidying up things that you think you got to do for your yard, if you leave some dead limbs around, some limbs that are starting to shed bark, leave a dried up patch of grass in the back corner, all this stuff is used by birds for nests. I watched this white winged crossbill build a nest for two weeks and the stuff she used was amazing. I mean, she was going up in the cottonwood and where the bark was sloughing off, she was shredding the inner bark of that tree and using that fine stuff for, for the liner. She was going down under the tree, under the roots that were sticking out of the ditch bank, getting fine roots, dead grass, pigeon feathers, mud. She was using all kinds of stuff. And so to have your yard be a little rough is probably really good for nesting birds because they've got materials to use. You don't have to go to the wild bird store and buy little bags of prepackaged nesting material. The birds will figure it out if your yard's got a little roughness to it. They'll make do with what you give them. And uh, dead branches and twigs and little fine stuff is, is, part, is a big part of that. There are some materials that are dangerous and that is usually plastic things, twine, binding twine, fishing line, deadly to birds. And they will, they will use it. They'll think they've got a super material to use it's going to last forever, man. This stuff is tough. And then you find them hanging from their own nest, tangled in it. Um, so if you want to do a project, go, go around the lake and pick up all the tangled fishing line and get rid of it and be careful about the hooks. Some of these materials are dangerous, so, and usually it's plastic. If it's fiber, uh, natural fiber, it's probably okay. If, if it's plastic, get rid of it. Wire, not good. Cavities are good. 50 birds in, in this state live in holes. Woodpeckers make all the holes. And then the other uh, 40 species that, that aren't woodpeckers use the holes. So this is a built-in problem in the city. A hole in a tree usually means a lawyer, means hazard, means rotten trees. And if there's a target under those trees, they're usually taken out. But if there isn't a target, just because it's dead doesn't mean it's not a good tree to have for wildlife. And I would leave up as many trees with holes in them as you can. And some people with backyard habitat even plant dead trees with holes in them, stick them in the ground and put concrete there. And they, they plant a snag for cavity nesting birds. So holes are good for birds. And uh, this is one where you think it's gonna be a screech owl hole and it ends up being a starling hole. Eh, go with it. It doesn't always work out the way you want. Same with nest boxes. If you don't have any holes and you want to have some of those cavity nesting species, you can put up boxes. I'm usually not a big fan of boxes, especially if they're in public property, like a scout project or whatever, and somebody wants to put up a line of 50 boxes on a bike trail. They're, they're not scouts forever, and when they're not scouts, it's about when the boxes start falling down and nobody's there to maintain them, and then they become aerial litter. So if it's a box and it's going to be in your yard and you're going to take care of it, Yes, uh, you know, putting up a bunch of bluebird boxes and then walking away and letting them fall down is not really doing that much good for the birds or people's eyes. Things can go wrong. Squirrels are at the top of the list, all right? Uh, you get these other things. You get, I had this one lady call me, she was irate because a wren nested in her bluebird box. It happens, you know? There's worse things that could happen. Get a life. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, flickers come in and you, you can't sleep in the morning during breeding season because they're drilling, drumming on the metal. You know, the state engineer can make you drain your pond. A lot of things can go wrong. So I'm, I'm trying to do like Boris did and make you realistic. These are all animal damage things. That cottontail rabbit, when you come back and you find your favorite woody shrub clipped at a 45 degree angle, that's cottontail rabbits. Porcupine chews a big patch out of your pine tree. The upper right there is, uh, Aspen, they put the fencing up to keep the elk off of it and the elk chewed right above the fencing. So if you're gonna fence out something, at least fence it out tall enough for that species. That'd be a good idea. That one kind of cracked me up. This is in a state park where they ought to know better. Sap suckers, lower left, where they're drilling holes in your tree. They will usually not kill the tree, so don't go shoot the sap sucker, the woodpecker. 
If you have a horse and trees, the horse is going to chew on the trees, I'm guessing, even if it's a Mongolian horse at the zoo. And then if you see little trails like that, that's a vole. That's their above ground tunnels. So things, you know, it's not going to be perfect. So be realistic. If you're a control freak, I say take up model railroading where you can build your own little town and make them go in the direction you want and pick how many people and how many cars and you can control that. So here's, here's just some real quick special birds that we could expect in Fort Collins, hummingbirds. And I mentioned some plants on there in the handout that are good for it. If you wanna go see hummingbirds and what they like, go over to the Plant Environmental Research Center, the Perk Gardens at CSU in, in July and August, September, and watch what the hummingbirds are on. And they're usually on these plants that I've mentioned here. Tubular flowers usually, but things like paintbrush also. And we have broadtail, rufous, and calliope in, in this town. Broadtail nests in the foothills. I've seen a few nests in town. Calliope and Rufus come through here in migration, and now we've got a fourth one, the black chin hummingbird. It's now moved up here from parts south, so black chin is now possible. If you see a hummingbird with a purple throat in your yard, it's a black chin, and it is possible nowadays. Flicker, kind of a mixed bag with this. Some people love them, some people hate them. They eat lots of ants in your, in your lawn, and they also drum on your vent pipe and maybe the side of your house. And uh, there are things you can do. There's an extension fact sheet from CSU on how to discourage uh, flickers, which are a type of woodpecker. This should be our state bird, I think. They go right through Fort Collins, usually on the 25th of May. Uh, there's one day, usually, where you see western tanagers all over town. And it's a glorious day, and people want them to stay, and they go up into the foothills and kind of disappear for another year. But this is a, this is a beautiful bird, a western tanager, and it should be our state bird. Our state bird is lark bunting. Uh, because it can be reproduced on stationary in black and white cheaply. <laughs> so uh, politicians, that's a, po that's a political state bird. Black-headed grosbeak, I mean, they'll be here in about a month at, at your feeder if you've got one with, with sunflower seeds. Uh, Bullock's oriole is our default oriole in this part of the world, uh, related to the Baltimore oriole back east. Absolutely gorgeous bird, and this is probably the bird that's the most prone to using fishing line and stuff like that in their nest and then getting killed by their own nest. So if you want to pick up that stuff, do so in the name of the beautiful uh, Bullock's Oriole. And cedar Waxwing, everybody wants these. If you've got junipers or berry plants, sooner or later you're going to have them in your yard. And they're really awesome, classy looking bird. Wilson's warbler is our most abundant warbler in the fall around here and you can see 101 day walking the river uh, on the bike trail. They're yellow but they, if you look carefully they got a black cap. They're not a canary and they're not a yellow warbler, they're a Wilson's warbler and they breed in our high mountains in the willow cars at 9, 10,000 feet and then come through here in the fall. They don't come through here very much at all in the summer or in the spring. They have a circular migration and this, they sneak into the mountains and then pour out right through our area. So you see zillions of Wilsons in the fall, very few in the spring. This is the big bad hawk that killed your little bird at your feeder. And uh, it's cool, it's noble, it's, it's, it's an honor to have one in your backyard. And don't be the person that wrote the letter to the bird journal. What do I do about this chicken hawk? They're all right, they're predator, predators. We need predators and we don't necessarily need one more house finch, so it's okay. <laughs> White crowned sparrow is a neat one that we get in the winter only around here, and the adults are on top, the immatures on the bottom, and a lot of people have trouble identifying the immatures. That's the trouble with getting a book that has one picture of a bird in it. It doesn't show you male, female, adult, immature. So get a book with as many pictures, many varieties and angles as possible. And probably the ultimate field guide is going to be online someday when each species, we have 200 pictures of each species, you just can't carry it in your pocket out in the field. But Pine siskin, really cool bird, little tiny bird. If you ever get up close to them, they're really neat little birds. And uh, a finch, they'll go to your niger thistle, they'll maybe go to sunflower, but probably thistle. They're right in there with the goldfinches. And all this kind of stuff is possible at your feeder. And so this is your temptation. This is why you do it for the day one of those shows up at your feeder. Purple finch, upper left. Calliope hummingbird in the middle. Casson's finch, upper right. Rosy finch in the middle, which we used to see those in Fort Collins in, in feeders, like upper long horse tooth or 
the port, you'd get them in feeders. I, I, it's been a long time since we've had rosy finches in town. Uh, Lazuli bunting, middle right, lower right, Inca doves. I've seen a few Inca doves at feeders in Fort Collins. They're a southwestern bird, but possible. That bottom was the streak-backed, the famous streak-backed oriole that showed up in Loveland at uh, Connie's feeder. Crazy bird, that's a Mexican bird that showed up in winter and spent the winter in Loveland. You know, eating zillions and zillions of mealworms and uh, had hundreds of people come to see it. But that kind of thing is possible and you feed birds, you're gonna see 10 species all the time and then that one Waldo bird that shows up, I don't know what that one is, what's that one? That's why you do it. That's, that's why you play the game is, is to see those rarities. Rose-breasted grosbeaks, male and female on the platform on the lower left. Um, so all that stuff's possible. And who knows, you might even see a white-winged crossbill and uh, change your life, and change my life. I mean, I, I live at the cemetery now. <laughs> and, uh, People send me emails about, are my lips crossing? Do you have a plot? Um, thanks for the update, but you need to get a life. Um, but I'm the one that's got a life, and they just, that's their loss if they're not out there. But um, anyway, they're very cool. So have fun in your yard. <laughs>